What's up, everybody? Rob Gill, Epic Financial Strategies, and today we're going to talk about why financial education is important at every age. So what's up, everybody? Rob Gill, I'm here with my partner, Dave Harder. How are you doing, brother? What's up, Dave? How you doing, man? Could not be better. Looking good with the blue and the blue. Well, you're looking pretty good yeah, with the, the blue Florida and the trip. Yeah, absolutely, too. My eyes are incredible. So <laughs> with that being said, um, why don't we get into, you know, what is a good time or what is a good age to teach your children and how should you teach your children about money? Yeah, sure. Sure. Absolutely. You know, I, I know one of the things is not by letting them just buy whatever they want on Xbox. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that we do, yeah, like, but but yeah. I don't think that's going to help them. But what say you, all seriousness? I mean, in all seriousness, you know, the, the world is becoming a more difficult place and a more congested place and a more challenging place for the youth every single day, right? And so vaulting into education and understanding a little bit more around financial literacy, not, it's not just balancing a checkbook anymore, Rob, right? It's exposure to different, call it entrepreneurial strategies, but saving strategies in general that they're going to have to put in place now because their life expectancy is going to be a hell of a lot longer than ours is. Yeah, and I think what's interesting, when I think of my, my oldest, who's a freshman in high school, I was like, hey, Rob, you know, I got 20 bucks. You want it? He goes, no, I don't need it. I, I buy everything on this, right? So I don't even know what that means. Like, I can't imagine life without cash in my pocket. However, society is moving in that direction, right? That's happening every single day, all day, twice on Sunday. So when we think about you know, how do we educate our kids? I think it comes down to the discipline of sharing with them the value of money, uh, maybe instilling in them the consciousness or the emotional um, abundant mindset towards money versus scarce mindset. Um, can You know, I don't think stuff like, and I'm guilty of this, hey, I bought that for you. Um, you know, be careful how you use it or, or look at all this money that we're spending on this. I don't think that kind of message lands mm. with kids because I remember when I was growing up, it didn't land with me, Yeah. right? Yeah. I did grow up blue collar. We did struggle from paycheck to paycheck, but I remember the messaging didn't land well. So I think I think the first thing would be how to uh, have the communication with your children and really begin to paint the picture you know, maybe do demonstrations of like, if you do this, this is what it looks like. If you receive this money, this is what it looks like after taxes, right? Now, for all you folks out there, for, for our kids, my kids, I do have life insurance policies on all three of them, which is to pay, is, is really for them to be able, for us to be able to pay for college through those policies. And the reason why we did it is because, um, you know, we understand that, hey, we want money to earn a rate of return even after we pay for something. So instead of just paying college directly where we lose the opportunity cost on that money and it goes to the college and the college buys beautiful paintings and beautiful furniture, we want to be able to give college money through a, a, a PRISM, life insurance policy, right. that's earning a rate of return. So by the time my child is 30 and recovered the money that was borrowed from the policy to pay for college, we can now give it to our children. So that that's our mindset. Yep. Um, but being able to not just give it to them, explain to them how it works. What sure. say you? Well, and then what you've also done, Rob, is you've laid the foundational groundwork for the Swiss Army knife that is a life insurance policy as they move forward too, right? Because not only, I mean, they're, in, they're inheriting a completely different world than the world that we grew up in, right? We grew up in a society where you, you, know, you went to college and then you got a job and you did the 401k and you did blah, blah, blah and followed the herd mentality. Mm -hmm. This world that we're operating in now is so much different and there's so many different opportunities to accumulate wealth. So not only did we d create a vehicle where they can eliminate college debt, eliminate student loan debt, but also continue to benefit from the leverage that those insurance policies continue to provide. When they're in their, when they're in their 20s, in their 30s, they can use that to you know, create uh, alternative asset streams for themselves, alternative income streams for themselves, but also when they're you know getting older and when they're getting closer to retirement the back end benefit of what they started and what we started for them now is going to massively accelerate their tax free income yeah and, and and that's a great point so but think of it this way if you have children and you start the policies at the right time and you're building up cash value maybe one of the things you could do to supplement colleges have those policies cash value by real estate yep that eventually you give to your children, right? And then the renter's paying back your policy when your kid's between age 12 and 22. And I'm saying 22 because 
you'd want to be able to get student loans from 18 to 22 and then pay back the student loans as the cash value accelerates and or the real estate property that you bought them. But what if your kid gets a scholarship? Well, guess what? There's money there for your child to start their own business or buy their first house. Um, I wouldn't want them to buy the house, so I'd rather put them into a business that they could, you know, and this is where the constant education, and by the way, with, they don't teach this stuff in schools. No. You're from an educational background. Yep. They don't teach this stuff in schools, um, but it's important that's a constant evolutionary education for the kids. There's no doubt about it. And also getting them to understand good debt and bad debt, right? Getting them to understand, like building up basic things such as credit, but also how to manage credit so that, you know, you don't put yourself into a position where you have a bad credit score and now you can't get access to leverage. You can't finance vehicles. You can't get pre-approved for mortgages, right? So all of those foundational building blocks now get them so much more prepared, Rob, for when they're going to be taking on brand new responsibilities such as purchasing homes, making, if they want to invest into a, into a business, if they don't have cash value life insurance and they have to get credit for it, mm -hmm. or they have to get leverage for it, they have to have credit for it as well, yes. right? So it's, you know, instilling, these were things, unfortunately, I didn't get taught, yep. you know, and yep. instilling how to manage debt, how to manage interest rates, and how to just literally create goals. You know? Absolutely. And going over and reviewing with them and making adjustments along the way. Right. So why don't we get into some financial planning tips? And remember, what's important, folks, is it's fluid, right? Um, you may see a CFP and they're going to tell you that you may have done everything wrong unless you work with them first. <laughs> I've seen that movie before, um, which I think is just horrible. Although there is magic in the method of of integration and coordination, not only of your assets, right? And this is gonna tie into financial planning based on age group and, and, and sequence of time. But also it's important that the CFP, and a lot of them don't do it, connect the accountant to the insurance agent, to the fiduciary, or vice versa, the fiduciary to the CFP. So for all you CFPs out there that don't believe in insurance, that doesn't mean you tell your client not to buy it. Or that doesn't mean you tell your client to buy term and invest the difference to a 401k, because I would argue all day long that if you're gonna go general and you're gonna make it in generalizations like that, you are not serving that client's best interest and you're creating damage for generational wealth. With that, yeah. what are some financial planning tips for people in their 20s? In their 20s? Oh, shoot. Um, well, the first one, the first thing is without a shadow of a doubt, get yourself budgeted and pay yourself no less than 20%. What does that mean, get budgeted? Get budgeted, I mean, get everything on the one landing page, you know? How, so How do they do that? Well, there's a couple of different ways. They can use the Epic Wealth Builder, right? Yep. Which is our financial planning software that can put everything onto one landing page, your assets, your debts, your liabilities, your cash flow, or use Microsoft Excel, but use a system and have a system to get all the moving parts of your income relative to your expenses on one landing page. Analyze what those look like and carve out a piece of that budget to be paying yourself first. No less than 20% of your income. And then the second thing is leverage your age. You're never going to be more insurable than you are in your 20s where your two feet are planted right now, Rob, right? So the first thing, it, so, so get evaluated and find out, uh, you know, how and leverage how insurable that you actually are. So Put the foundation in place to get a life. How problems. would you recommend someone in their 20s right now that's watching this video? No. How would you recommend that they interview people to be part of their financial planning world? How, how should they pick an accountant? How should they pick, uh, pick a fiduciary? Or how do they pick an insurance agent? Well, it's obviously, it comes with two things, obviously, comfort, recommendation. Is but there then, questions they should ask? Well, yeah. One of the questions is, hey, if you were me, what would you be doing? Right? That's question number one. Question number two is, how am I compensated? You know, like, what do I get paid? How do I get paid? And have, have understanding and transparency. All professionals deserve to get paid if they're doing their job. Understand how they get compensated. You have a right to understand that, and they have the right to get paid for that. Um, but then in addition to it... Um, Understand what their service model looks like, right? Understand how frequently that they intend on being in touch with you and is what they intend on, is their uh, communication model in line with what your expectations are. So, and so, we know that going in. So, for, yeah, so just to clarify and verify, for you in your 20s, make sure that you get roles and responsibilities in writing. Yep. Make sure you understand that there's going to be quarterly meetings to review everything that you went over. Make sure that you get educated as much as you can with, with your accountant and the strategies that you're gonna do there. None of this is complicated. I know they don't teach it in school, but this is why we're sharing this information because listen, typically people typically don't get married until they're in their 30s. Alicia, how old are you? 30. 
And when did you get married? 24. She's from Utah, so that's a little bit different. <laughs> um, so, but the point is, though, typically people get, so people like me make financial mistakes in their 20s, right? So when you're in the pay yourself first model, when you're in the budgeting model, um, and to David's point, saving 20%, all the great fundamentals that are necessary, but take it a step further. And, and when an accountant hears you interview them, they're gonna respect that. When a planner hears you interview them, they're gonna respect that. And in that space, you're gonna be able to create the spiritual mindset which leads to monetary abundance by doing it this way. But remember, you gotta wake up every day in a peak state. How do you wake up every day in a peak state? Well, there's certain exercises you could do to get into your nervous system so you could wake up and be able to handle world as it's coming at you versus instead of reacting, you're responding, you're maneuvering, you're able to go with the ebbs and flows, right? Yeah, whoever's out there, you didn't know I can move like this, right? Don't, don't get it twisted because I'll come at you just like this. But with that being said and done, David, yeah. now the person's in their 30s and they just got married. Uh, now you got a whole different slew of responsibilities. The first thing is, in my opinion, the, your first responsibility, you got married, you have kids, you got to get yourself some legal documents. Right? What does you that gotta, mean? You got to get a last What does that mean to Mary, Joe, and Jack that's listening? Hey, right Mary, now? Joe, Jack, get a will. Seriously, how would you feel if your state government was making decisions for your kids on their finances that you slaved to, 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 to uh, create? You sound like you're mad at them, though. I am a little pissed. All right, don't be. They didn't. They didn't make a mistake. <laughs> they're just. They're just subjecting themselves to the rules that are out there because they're being misinformed on a daily basis. This is true. Give this them your true. heart. Let them feel your love. The reality is. The reality is. Um, get a last will and testament. Get a healthcare directive. Get powers of attorney. Get all that stuff set up now, because it's the appropriate thing, in my opinion anyway, the appropriate parental thing to do for your kids. Yeah, and one of the beautiful things you always do with every single client that we meet is you're, you're the first one saying, hey, let's bring in Mike Gorman, yeah. who's an estate attorney, yeah. right? They're like yeah. David is always, let's bring in Mike Gorman, let's bring in the accountant, let's make sure that they're connected and on the same page. And for the folks in their 30s that are getting married, right? Yep. They're going to have some babies on the way, mad bills to pay, Biggie Smalls, 1993 or four, Drop. I forget. Yeah, 93. Right? 93. Mad bills to pay, baby yeah. on the way, That's right? right. Yeah. And from that perspective, if you've had the discipline, and by the way, if you didn't save in your 20s, that doesn't mean because you're in your 30s, it's too late. It just means you didn't save in your 20s. You know, right. you can't live in the past, <laughs> but now let's talk a little bit about it. Okay, is there a 401k in your world? Let me be clear, David and I are not fiduciaries, right? But we'll come across clients that have 401ks. Sure. And sometimes the match is 4%, but sometimes folks go to 8%. Yeah. All right, so folks, listen, we went over 20s and 30s. If you're 40s and your 50s, it's, once again, it's never too late. There's different advantages you have. Historically speaking, people make the most money in their life, usually in their 50s. They make all the mistakes in the 40s and the 30s. What say you, David, about that, you know, the mindset of the 40 and 50-year-old that's looking to make corrective action steps because they've made mistakes in the past. Define what your emotional tie is to money, what money means to you, what your tolerance is to taking on risk, to growing out wealth, but also define what wealth maximization really means to you. Are you and your wife, are you and your husband in line together? Do you share the same core belief system? But most importantly, define how you feel, which, how you feel emotionally towards your dollars and where your dollars want to where you want your dollars to accelerate. I love everything you just said and let's assume that they're not aligned. Mm. We're not marriage counselors, right? No. no. But how, <laughs> how do they get aligned? Like what's what do they do? Well, it's and I'm I'm curious. Yeah. Well, I think it starts with consultation, right? I think you need a media we're not marriage counselors, but we are, you know, to we financial and, doctors? We are financial doctors. Do we do financial <laughs> surgery? Do we CPR. do financial CPR? A little CPR. Do they call us into financial emergency rooms to be able to save lives? Paging Dr. Gill. Yes. Paging Dr. Gill. Also Lieutenant Governor. Lieutenant Governor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, no, but that's great. Keep going with that. I love what you're saying. You know, I, but, but you, do need, you, you do need a mediator, right? I think, number one. Right? Financial so mediator. Financial mediator. I also, I think that that financial mediator needs to understand who the other call it trusted advisors are in their world, right? Yep. To make sure that all of those trusted advisors are creating a round That's table. the key. Yeah. You That's know. the key. So the messages can't get deleted, distorted, Correct. right? Or diluted because the accountant's saying one thing, the insurance saying agent is saying another thing, and the advisor or um, fiduciary is saying something different. It, 
Go ahead, Bob. No, no, you go. Listen, yeah. creating alignment, I think, is the key. Well, because then, well, alignment, because then when you move into your 50s, that's when the repercussions of the decisions that you made, you really, really start to feel because now you have new decisions that are coming down your pipeline, too. Now you have to start thinking about the second half of your journey, right? You have to start thinking about mm. not only retirement, that but brother you also wants have to, to take some people down the mountain right now. No, I, dude, I go down the mountain. All you want to day. take people down the mountain? I do want to. Tell yeah. the 60 year olds how you're going to take them down the mountain. Look, look, at the end of the day, there's two sets. There, there's two sets to everybody's journey: the climb up the mountain, which is saving; the climb down the mountain, which is retirement distribution. If you made the choices that Rob and I are talking about in your 20s and in your 30s, 40s and 50s, 40s and 50s, even you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. 50s, is, it's, it's never too it's late never to too start. Late. Yep. But when when you hit your 60s. Now you're going to be flush with the, the, it's going to hit you straight in the face. The fact that your assets that you worked so hard to accumulate have to create the income that you were working for, right? For and life. For life. Yeah. For life. That's exactly right. And then on top of that, not only do we not know how long that life expectancy is going to be, so we have to account for that distribution forever, yep. quite frankly. Uh, but number two, you got new inflation, right? And it's not just milk, eggs, and cheese. It's extended care. Right. It's, you know, potential sicknesses that can come down, you know, all of these new expenses that get introduced into people's worlds, the older that we get, that if they're not if they're not present and accounted for vis-a-vis -vis making those decisions in your 30s, 40s and 50s, um, you're going to erode a tremendous amount of wealth. And what do you when you say down the mountain? Yep. What does that actually mean to these folks? So quickly, 85% of the people that die climbing Mount Everest, and you can look up this stat on Google yourself, die on the way down. Why? Why? Because they expanded all their time, money, and energy trying to climb up to the top. The point of climbing Mount is not to get to the top, it's to get back down safely in the financial planning space. Coming down the mountain is spending the assets, but do you spend it down to zero and leave your kids nothing? No, you want to leave a legacy. To leave a legacy, you have to have life insurance. It's, so, it's an so absolute must. I think what you're saying is they take overall less risk and still get more net spendable income in their pocket. And whenever they do do the mortal coil shuffle, that means pass away, what begins or what would happen is whatever they spent in life would be replaced by that net death benefit. This correct? is literally why they call him the ambassador of results. No question. Lieutenant governor. Lieutenant governor. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Lieutenant Gil. governor, Dr. Gill, full effect. Anyway, every day we're pushing content. Every day we're providing massive education. Go ahead and click the link below. One of the team members of Epic will get back to you with any questions you may have, uh, provide world-class education, and be able to become maybe a, a friend that can give good information that can help you make sound decisions that has an impact on your life and your money, generationally speaking.